Facebook. We're just going to see ourselves in here. And we're live. And we're live. <laughs> we're live on SSM Health Trefford Steve. SSM Health Tre Recording in progress. <laughs> Trefford TV. All right, Dr. Up. Chapman. So what a what an honor and a pleasure it is to be uh to be going live with my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Ashvin Sood here. Uh, we could introduce each other. Yes. So this, this guy is uh, coming at us live from somewhere in Virginia. Where? Richmond. In Richmond, Virginia. Virginia. Um, and he is our uh, newest child and adolescent psychiatrist working here at SSM Health Trefford Studios. Now he's not here. I'm here, which is why I have the um, <laughs> fancy microphone that's not live, but it, it gives me the good look of uh, of being live. I'm here at Trefford Studios. You're over there, and uh, we're we're just here to um, talk about really anything mental health. This is more of a uh, a test broadcast than anything else. But we look forward to using this time to um, start doing some live interactive kind of uh, mental health related hangouts. So I started to introduce you, Dr. Sood, uh, and uh, I didn't get very far, I got sidetracked, but- No, that is totally fine. And we'll talk about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder later. <laughs> Put it on the list, put it on the list. Yeah. But I, I would love the opportunity to introduce you, Dr. Jeremy sure. Chapman, to the, sure. the, the greater Fond du Lac area, as I've learned to pronounce appropriately, as well as Wisconsin. Um, so Dr. Jeremy Chapman uh, is this wonderful board-certified adult and child and adolescent psychiatrist who, with uh, the assistance of Dr. Donald Trefford, helped create the Trefford Studios. The Trefford Studios. Many, is, many other people involved. And, and, and of course. Co-founders. Co -founders. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but Dr. Chapman is, is our kind of medical director at the studios. He, he has helped create with co-founders this 8,500 square foot, amazing kind of mental health clinic in which we can see patients, in which we can do group therapy, in which we all have all types of fun games and groups and all types of things for the Fond du Lac community. Uh, and so it's just this really, really cool model. And so Dr. Chapman, a wonderfully uh, recruited me to help work out and work in as a virtual psychiatrist. And we're coming at you live tonight to, to kind of talk about all things mental health related. And that's another thing that we can talk about, by the way. So just for everyone who's watching, and I, I can't see how many, but I'm assuming there's a few million watching. You can put <laughs> chats uh, either on Zoom if you are in our public Zoom meeting or webinar, uh, or you can put uh, comments, questions into the chat within our Facebook live stream. So I, I think people are probably more likely to be watching on Facebook right now. Um, as we continue to grow this, uh, there are two ways to participate in, and uh, and be in on the action of these. But any uh, comments, questions, or, or topics that do come through in those chats will be routed to us. I don't think we'll see them immediately, but um, we have our trusty um, marketing team, aka one Jace Como, who is here, uh, do working all the back end stuff for us and making this possible. So we would love to respond to any uh, questions that we get from people out there. We're not your doctors, but we are doctors, and um, so we're happy to try and help in any way that we can. Of course, if there's any actual emergency or medical concern you have. Uh, you know, you need to take care of that in a safe way on your own. Um, what other types of disclaimers do you think we should drop right now? Well, I think that the biggest thing, and, and also, you know, like us on Facebook, like us on our social media. Like, pages. follow, share. Yeah, we, 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 physicians don't typically advertise that, but we're pushing for that because we want people to know about kind of the services we provide here at SSM Health, Trefford Studios, and just kind of general awareness. Our, our job on this kind of overall, I guess if you call it Facebook Live slash podcast, is to provide kind of like evidence-based education about mental health and to kind of take your questions and kind of think about them more so and try to provide the general public with, you know, our thoughts and, uh, you know, how we approach different clinical scenarios or or just if you have questions about medications and we want to try to be a trusted source in the community. Love, I love how you've put that. And uh, assuming that we don't get uh, questions or if there's any um, lulls in activity, again, I, I, I'm, I am assuming that there's thousands of questions coming in and <laughs> 
Jace is just triaging them and sorting through them. Um, but in the meantime, um, we can just kind of riff and chat about anything. It does happen to be National Mental Health Awareness Month. I think that's the correct name of this month. Uh, mm -hmm. last, we're just coming off the tale of Autism Awareness Month, which is April. Uh, and now we have the more general Mental Health Awareness Month. So what better time to start um, broadcasting live mental health related content, educational content than, than right now. Um, do you, Dr. Sood, in your um, kind of uh, uh, practice or world, do anything in particular to commemorate this month other than, you know, just carrying on with your job? Yeah. So, you know, May is, is, a, is a pretty important month in my mind, because when I think about mental health, I think about the seasonal changes. I think about weather. I think about, you know, kind of this time of like where people kind of come out and it's spring, right? And so what I've been talking with my patients more, and I think about, you know, coincidentally with May mental, like mental health awareness month, is exercise. I think of commemorating May as a good time to kind of start of, instead of like, you know, January and New Year's resolutions of going to the gym or going for walks or exercising more. I like May to also be another commemoration of that. And the weather is getting nicer. I know I'm in Richmond, Virginia, and you're, you're up in Wisconsin and Fond du Lac. So. 75 and sunny today. Look how beautiful that is, right? Look how nice that is. Perfect. Yep. And and there was new literature that just came out. I think it was in the New England Journal of Medicine that talks about how protective exercise is and against depression and other mood disorders. And so when I think about Mental Health Awareness Month in May, I, that's the first thing that kind of pops up in my mind is like the weather's nice, you know, patients may have been on medications for a while. And, you know, we can kind of consider like what would going outside be like right now? How would that feel for your mental health? What's it like to get, you know, vitamin D exposure from the sun and how that would help for your mental health? So that's how I would think of commemorating it. Do you, do you have any, any thoughts about that? or hey, any ways so, so what are you doing? What are you doing to get your body moving? What are you doing outside? And what am I doing? Well, uh, in my little office, I have a little Peloton uh, machine, bike oh, machine right. that keeps me going. <laughs> um, but the weather's Behind really the nice. Scenes, cribs with Dr. Food. <laughs> Here's with Dr. C. Welcome to my crib. Uh, and let uh, Snoop Dogg's voice in here. Um, but uh, yeah, no, what I do is I typically, because the weather's nice, there's some great running parks around here. So I'm getting back into jogging, getting back into running uh, around, um, uh, kind of just like used to be a cross country runner. So that's been really nice. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and some people have more of the luxury of working at home, uh, like post pandemic. And if they're kind of like me behind the computer screen, I always tell people, you know, go spend an hour outside, whether it's at a coffee shop, I go to a coffee shop now, like literally once or twice a week. And I just sit out, even if it's just like 30 minutes, 45 minutes, just to sit outside in the sun. It is so nice to have a change in routine. It is so important because we know that, you know, if you're sedentary or you're sitting for a long period of amount of time, it really takes a drag on your mental health. So implementing those kind of daily routines, so important. And that's what I've been trying to do more. It, you know, you can always fall off the bike, quote unquote, literally and metaphorically. Uh, but it's always good to try to get back on uh, and do your best. So that's that's what I kind of think about of like, how do I get myself out there? Is that where that expression came from? Do you think? I think it was like fall off the horse, right? <laughs> Not the bike. True. <laughs> yeah, right. Fall off the, but what, I mean, I wonder if it was because horseback riding was the form of exercise, and then and then they somebody uh, I see was, was doing a daily ride, and then and then fell off their horse, and then fell out of their exercise routine from it. Sure. That's where it came from. If you're out there watching and you know the answer to this, please chime in and let us know. Please, please. I want people, uh, Jeremy was talking about this earlier. I want people to also think of this this kind of uh, chat or uh, this live as podcast uh, as a, a car talk from NPR. Car talk. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, we have yes. a question that came in, I, but just uh, real quick. So uh, if anybody out there knows what car talk is with click and clack, uh, it's like the the Chazuwick brothers, it's not their last name, but they are um, amazing. Uh, 
duo of Italian brothers who I think uh, were educated at Harvard, brilliant, brilliant people. They're, they're not on the air anymore, but for many, many years, they ran on, on national public radio, just talking about cars and people would call in and, and say, I have a 19, you know, 87 Nissan, this or that, and it's making that noise and they would diagnose it together. But, but what I loved about the show was it, they were just always laughing. They were always um, Mess, you know, messing with each other, making each other laugh, um, teasing each other, and and the people who are calling in. It was just, you don't have to like cars to enjoy it. So that would be a goal of this is that you don't necessarily have to be super, um, you don't have to be like a mental health professional to to feel like this is a good use of time to, you know, hang out with us here and learn with us. Um, I, I, it should be uh, laid back and fun. And that's what we're, and, and educational if we can. So on that yeah. note, and by the way, I keep a soccer ball in my office. <laughs> I was like, where did the soccer ball come from? <laughs> it's, very, it's flat right now. I need to get a pump for it. But um, you never know when it's going to come in handy to have a soccer ball in your office. That's true. So, That's true. Keep that in mind. <laughs> um, we have a question that came in. Can you get diagnosed with autism as an adult? I'll let you have the first crack at that. Yeah. yeah. And, and this is a great, great question. So autism, you know, it's, it's become more aware in public and society about like, you know, this is a diagnosis that exists. We're becoming more aware, of, general public has become more aware of symptoms, such as like the major symptoms of autism being kind of like fixed rigidity and difficulty with transitions and, high, and, sense, and sensory issues as well. And then lacking because sometimes the social and emotional reciprocity skills. And these are like, you know, picking up on social cues, verbal cues, things of that nature. And so we've learned a lot about this. Um, uh, uh, we've known about this as child psychiatrists, but the general public is learning more about it. And we've gotten a lot of uh, questions from adults being like, I resonate with a lot of these symptoms. And so, yes, you can get diagnosed with autism uh, as an adult. Um, the way we typically screen for autism is actually early childhood at your pediatrician's office. Typically, the first time is around 18 months where they go through a screening called the MCHAT. And the MCHAT is basically a screening questionnaire given to parents about certain developmental milestones in which a child may or may not have gone through. And if that screening is positive, they're typically sent to a specialist, like a psychologist um, who can run certain other tests. And these are much more kind of uh, detailed examinations. It's not blood tests or anything of that nature, but it's more direct observation for longer periods of time, sometimes one hour, two hours, multiple hours, things of that nature. And that's where typically a diagnosis can come from. The diagnosis of autism is not just used through these little screening tests or tools, but it's also a clinical diagnosis, meaning that a psychiatrist or a pediatrician or a physician in coordination with a psychologist or another type of therapist kind of talk together using those screening tools and come up with that clinical diagnosis. And one of those clinical uh, uh, tools known as the ADOS, which I can't remember the, the full the uh, definition. Some, uh, uh, di I, I don't want to embarrass myself either. No, 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 that's why. <laughs> uh, observation schedule. Observation. Exactly. They have yeah. one for adults in which adults can get kind of evaluated and they have it specified for adults in general. And so yes, that can occur. I think one of the big things, well, I'll stop right there for a second. Dr. Chapman, do you have any other things you want to add to Dude, that? You're cruising. You're cruising. The only thing I'm going to add is we may be lucky enough to have our presence graced by an adult who has autism at some oh. point during this call. Uh, awesome. An amazing asset to this call. We'll see if we can get him on here. Um, oh, but, yeah, but carry on. Go ahead. You, you're, you're cruising there. I'm loving oh. it. I tend to cruise, but I tend to over talk. So I need the audience as well as Dr. Chapman and Spencer to call me out if I do that. Um, but the the ADOS, which is given to adults as well, can occur. Now, to get that type of clinical testing and clinical assessment, we have to understand the realities, right? There are not a lot of mental health providers out in the world. And even with those providers, they might not be trained with screening for autism. So it often is a long wait to get a diagnosis or even an assessment for that. And typically an ADOS is a very specialized clinical tool. Now, now again, you don't necessarily need that, but it's a good way to define it. And the question is, is if you're given the diagnosis of autism, then what? 
I think that often is an important follow-up question. So if I flip it back to you, Dr. Chapman, yeah, what would I, you do? And I was going to say the, another, uh, another way to ask that question that you just asked is, you know, the, the question that we got was, can you get diagnosed with autism as an adult? And we've, we've now answered that, which is the answer is yes. But, you know, the other question to go with that also might be uh, phrased as, why get diagnosed with autism as an adult? You've mm -hmm. made it through the first 25 years of your life without the diagnosis slash label slash anything else that may come good or bad with that. Why would one seek that diagnosis at this point in their life? Again, if we can get um, our buddy Spencer up on this call, we'd love to hear from him. He wasn't diagnosed as an adult, but I'm pretty sure. But but in any case, he can speak from the lived experience of it. Um, it and I do get that question asked to me by um, by parents. Uh, you know, if their teenager may have autism, or if they themselves may have autism, you know, why why would I even do this? And a, a couple reasons, and this applies to really all ages. I will say, it's helpful to know. Um, what you are and who you are. Look at this. Look at this timing. The man, the myth, the legend, <laughs> Spenny, Spencer, De Spencer Deppies. Now you haven't met. I, I haven't met Spencer, but I've heard oh incredible things. So I'm stoked. This is so exciting. A live, a live, you guys are meeting on a live broadcast <laughs> the world. <laughs> <laughs> what cooler way to meet? Well, uh, we were just, we'll let you introduce yourself in, in a second, Spencer, but uh, we, we were just talking a little bit about adults with autism because a question that we got from uh, the crowd who was watching, and we appreciate the question, by the way, is can you get diagnosed with autism as an adult? And uh, Dr. Sud over here was answering that question, uh, gave a great answer to it. And I was like, guys, guys, audience, audience watchers, viewers, followers, we might be lucky enough to have someone join us soon. And bam, like magic. It's like we just, you know, it's like we just dialed you up and you were ready to go. So with no uh, further ado, let us also introduce here, Spencer, uh, give us give us your little kind of spiel of who you are and, and, and how you tie into here. Oh, no, we don't have you. We don't we don't have your audio. We need, Spencer. We need your volume here. We need your, your mic. mic. We're going to get it. What get one of those fancy mics that Dr. Mean? Chapman has. Otherwise, we're just going to have to read his lips. Uh, <laughs> let's see. We Can't can hear you yet. Here. Uh, and then while he does that, I want to read what's behind him. Parking, parking lot updates. No parking in lot. I wonder Nothing. where he is. is. Oh, we got that, you. There it is. We got you. There it is. There it we is. You. Welcome. The world is watching. Tell us who well, you are. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Thank you, Dr. Ashwin. I hope to live up to that amazing intro. Um, thank you for inviting me on. Yeah. So talking about adults living with autism, or I should say surviving in a world full of uncertainty for anybody at this moment, I think we can all take a step back and really understand that not just a person with autism, but anyone right now is probably dealing with a lot of stress. And I think we can all empathetically relate to that. But I think like one of the coolest things about being on the spectrum is the empathy that you have towards others once you can unlock that. Because I think the biggest part of it is in the beginning is the masking and all those, all those keywords that Dr. Chapman and I kind of saw you and Dr. Ashvin kind of talk about this a little bit in your earlier ones. But I think like the biggest one in general is masking to kind of like fit in but then once you're comfortable and you're confident and i would say once you do the work and you start getting the the reps in on how to communicate more or whatever your superpower is for that example and you start to just gain that momentum that's when you start like going back to where your roots are and the whole thing funny thing is it's just being yourself so if i can wrap that up in just a Beautiful summary. I would say that anyone on the spectrum already knows what their superpower is. And the average person is always looking for that. But I think it's already hidden where we are. What a what a magical he just he just spits this stuff. Yeah, uh, I was I'm I'm like still sitting with this, Spencer. That was incredible. He just spits it out. Well, so one of the really interesting things that you said though, 
you said the word empathy and you said you said that one of the superpowers of your autism is your is your level of empathy for others which i found very interesting because i think a public perhaps misconception and this is actually rooted in our our training and our diagnostic textbooks and stuff is that can i cut you off for one second dr yeah, Shatton? Yeah, 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 i'm go. so sorry yeah i don't really think it was really like yes i did have i guess a lot of empathy but for me kind of like what i talked to you this this after early this afternoon and talking about Dale Carnegie's book, yes. I was actually like a really big negative person in my life. And then it really switched after, cause I was really never a giver. I was always a taker and you can always kind of feel like what type of person someone is when you're talking to them or whatnot. And I was working at Walmart and I still remember to this day and I was boxing things at four o'clock in the morning. I was like, this is just, this is awful. And I said, there's got to be something more than this. And I was always this really serious analytical person. I think everyone has their own epiphany or their own moment. They can kind of look back in their life and be like, this was the time. And this was definitely one of the times of my calling. And it was a skill that I didn't have, but it really forced me to look inside myself. So to give it right back to you, it wasn't a skill that I always had. It just was something that was universal. Because if I really wanted to be successful or be someone that I'm not, I have to kind of create that habit and kind of almost the word, word I'm sorry, the right word I'm looking for is just kind of be habitual about it. But I think the universe knows and it'll kind of give us something, but it'll test us first before we get it. And I think you have to go through those tests in order to yeah. really go where you are. You and you've emerged from so many of those tests and challenges as the champion. And we can talk about you as a champion in just a bit because you're he's but but um, so this is, this is right in line with what I was saying is that it's, I think what I'm realizing just now in front of the universe here is that there's a huge and important difference between having empathy for others and expressing empathy for others. And in, in psychiatric training, and I think in the general populace, um, so autism is associated with a lack of empathy. And I think that's a, that is a, um, it's a, it's it does it's a disservice to folks with autism, and it's not that I, I think I'm just talking about you, for example. It's not that folks who have autism lack empathy for others, which is commonly believed, but I think maybe it's expressed differently, or maybe you have a difficult time expressing that empathy with others. And um, so when when you talked about bringing your mask off, Spencer, you know that's that your superpower is actually empathy. Once you have become better at, at expressing that empathy and articulating it and sharing it with others, it was not like it wasn't there, right? It was there all along. And yeah. when I have people in my office or when I open up my DSM-5, the Bible of, of psychiatric diagnosis, you know, people talk a lot about how folks who have autism have lack of empathy for those around them. And it's just, it's in the eye of the beholder, right? It's really that well, those around them can't understand or sense their empathy mm -hmm. until they kind of gain the kind of tools and we help them get those tools to access it. So I'm just going to throw that out there and let uh, everybody marinate on that for a bit. But look, we're just I'm sautéed in this, man. This is amazing stuff right here. Well, Spencer, I was <laughs> going to ask you that, um, and then Dr. Chapman, feel free to feel, feel free to jump off because I, I know you have- I'm going to go in about a few minutes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I want to ask you, you know, my work with autism, autistic individuals or individuals with autism is limited. I'm learning as a young physician kind of how to approach. And one of the things that came up, because I do a lot of work on uh, uh, social media and TikTok, and I get a lot of comments about what we talk about masking, understand masking. Could you tell me maybe a little bit of like the origin of masking from your perspective for you? Like, what is that? What is, how did that come about? And like, for individuals with autism or autistic individuals, what is that different for them and how they come across masking? That is an interesting takeaway. Um, just want to dial that down a little bit. So, Ashton, yeah. are you are you kind of communicating like the the mat like how what masking means to me? I'm sorry, my brain's just a little. No, no, no worries. No, it's like yeah. how did it originate for you? How like did how did it come yeah. about? Like was it like societal mm -hmm. pressures was it something that from uh, uh per, per family school things of that nature like that's what i'm because i'm yeah. new i'm new to this world so i would love to yep. learn that absolutely um i think it just became from like a lack of communication for me i kind of noticed when i was in school i do like these special ed classes and 
I just really couldn't communicate with the other people around me. And I'd have like a lot of thoughts and have a lot of feelings, which I didn't know how to express at that time. Uh And I would feel happy one second and then just uncontrollable rage, the next feeling, just because I didn't really know what was really inside me at that time and all the gifts and the opportunities that I did have in the future. But it was time and dedication and like, hey, maybe I'm feeling right now, I'm feeling a little happy or this time maybe feel a little hurt, but how do I express that in a way that I can communicate that without using physical violence or something of that stuff? I see. And one of the things that I think was really beneficial for me was, I think the number one thing is having an amazing support system, which is my mom and dad, of course, but my mom was like that type of person who was a therapist and kind of noticed right away, I was doing puzzles um, for like hours on end. She's like, this is kind of interesting. And she put me in sports right away because even though I had like I was wearing sweatpants and um, have best coordination, she he's cutting in and out. But I think I know where he's heading with this. So let's see if he comes back because it's a it's an exciting tale he's going to tell about his his world his venture into the world of athletics. Let's see if he comes back. But right now it's very very uh suspenseful Here yeah you're... it's like i'm like i'm like on the seat of my, uh, on the edge of my chair being like tell me tell me more i need we'll to hear this we'll see if our tech folks can text him and get him back on here um but uh he um you know at the risk of speak of telling his own story for him he um he has succeeded in the world of sports in a very cool way and i hope that uh, he hops back and if he doesn't hop back um We'll catch him on an, on a future one. I think that he should be a sure uh, recurring guest on this. I mean, slash co-host because he's as as you can already see in just the, the minutes that you've known him, Ashvin, that he's uh he's such an uh, engaging and charismatic guy to talk to, and it, just a, a yet another kind of I would say um, a, a misconception about autism right because he there's a um there are some real negative assumptions and generalizations about folks with autism and he is so uh you know animated his eye contact is so excellent he has he has worked a lot on his public speaking skills and uh, his communication skills and he is an example of somebody who um, has reached the point where to the typical passerby perhaps um, does not have a, a, as as um, pronounced of some of the kind of communication challenges that we mm-hmm. talk mm-hmm. about and see in folks with autism. And so that brings us right back to masking. You know, I, he's not at this point trying to fit in or look normal. He has just um, put in a lot of work and clearly had a lot of support to the point where um, you could have a whole conversation with him and, um, you know, may or may not have any idea that he has faced some of the challenges of being an individual with autism. Uh, he's texting us right now. I think he's probably lost his, uh, his Wi-Fi is shoddy. Um, <laughs> so he's going to try connecting another way. I yeah. will uh, I'll hang out for another couple minutes here. I mean, look, if I have to go and it's just you, you got hey, this. Hey, I'll too. talk. You got this. What are you hey, going to talk about if I go? What are you going to talk about if I disappear? Well, I'll open it to the audience. You know, uh, I will tell people, you know, whatever they want to talk about. I'm happy to chat with them. Um, mostly I'll talk about what it is like to see a psychiatrist. A lot of people have never yeah. even seen a therapist before. Like what does that look like? Uh, and so um, it's one of those things. Oh, sweet. Perfect. You keep that in your back pocket because now we got Spencer back. And Spence, I'm going to roll out while you keep going here. But it's yeah, absolutely. Fun. I got about five more minutes too, as well. Okay, okay. Perfect. perfect. So we'll end. We'll end in about. We'll end at seven. I'll. I'll. I'll close them out, Spencer. I'll be the anchor. Bring it on home. All right. It's been such a pleasure. I'm so happy that we're doing these. I'll see you guys later. Thank you so much, Dr. Chapman. Chapman. So, Spencer, you were talking yes. about kind of right at the sports, and then it got cut out. Exactly. Um, just to dial it down a little bit, but I could talk about myself. Everyone, I mean, everyone could talk about themselves, but I think the secret is, you know, number one, get yourself in a movement state, like anything. That's the best dopamine that you can give to yourself. And at the same uh-huh. time, it's a great learning mechanism down the road. So number okay. one support system, which hopefully the parents, if not, 
finding someone that can help you through that. Okay. Um, but dialing down number and two. And when you say help yourself, like express yourself. Express. In- yes. Got it. Expressing yourself. Um, yeah. Like for me, there's like so much, so much stuff, but I would say if I had to break it down into really quick summary would be having someone to let you express yourself. Like you said, Dr. Ashvin, number two would be getting physical activity out. So kind of creating a nice way to have camaraderie around something that you can get your movements out and your stress, but at the same time builds discipline. I think Uh discipline in anything is going to give you dividends and where you want to go. And then number three, kind of have like an emotional attachment to something where it kind of reacts to your goals. Because once you have that full circle, it kind of like feeds off each other. And then that's all you kind of need. Because when you look back at these amazing people in history books where you kind of read their own biographies, sorry, biographs, um, like Mr. Uh, let's see here, Einstein. I mean, yeah. the guy didn't know how to do addition, but yet he kind of knew how to do quantum science. So he had people underneath him that was a support system. And I sure. think- so many people, what they want to do is they want to create this whole new system. But I think if you look back in history, there's so many things you just reinvent the wheel and you yeah, can't take it, what you need. But brilliant. in all summary, Dr. Ashvin, I feel like maybe, maybe there is a little lack of empathy, but in this time of uncertainty right now, it's understandable. And I think in order to get water, you have to give water. And I think for a lot of people, it's hard to give water. I think Tony Robbins expresses that so well. And it's hard to be in a positive mindset sometimes, but the more repetitions do it, the more kind of like studying to be a doctor, um, the more you kind of just create, like there's a saying that was perfect. You'll never get your goals, but you'll get your standards. I love that. Yes. That is so right. You're so right. I love that. I appreciate that, Dr. Ashman. But I think the other thing though, too, is not just autistic individuals, but I feel like everyone... Even though we're our biggest hero, I think we're also our biggest critic. So kind of giving ourselves that self-love and gratitude, especially for people on the spectrum, because they always look at their deficits. It's not that they do it on purpose, but their mind just never stops moving. Awesome. Well, we need to grow them automatically. I'm sorry, Dr. Ashwin. No, no, you're, 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 I mean, you're, this is what Dr. Chapman was talking about. It's like what you, your words are so profound and you're nailing that right when you said, you know, it's not, what is it? It's not your goals it's your standards that you're going for right Mm -hmm. that is so important when we talk about becoming a doctor becoming a psychiatrist right you ask yourself like oh i want to fix this patient or i want to do this med right i want to do all this type of like these changes and and what you end up doing is that if you start trying to work with patients and meet them where they're at right then Mm -hmm. your standard becomes how can I have this relationship with somebody who wants to come back, who's willing to work with themselves? How can I have a good session with a person and feel like I'm connecting with them? That is the standard you want to get yourself to. And if there are any young doctors or people who are prospective medical students or anything like that, like that is the ultimate goal. Exactly. Yeah. And I think so Dr. Ashvin, you hit on the head, brother. I mean, to be a doctor, to go through the, all those medical studies, there's going to be a lot of pain, but once you get through that pain, there's going to be a lot of bliss. And I think yeah. um, Will Smith said it perfectly, like perfect analogy. When you're doing a skydive, yeah, it's really scary. But once you get on the other side of that pain and that fear, you're going to have more bliss. The more you go through pain, the more adversity there is, the more euphoria, the more um, just gratitude you're going to have in life. Gosh. Yes. Yes. You're absolutely, absolutely right. And having that support system through that pain is super important to to have that kind of pat on the back. mm -hmm. And I want to say this knowledge is simple by any means, but I think it's profound by the fact that anyone can do it. I think it's just like having that support system, having the emotional ties to keep you consistent. But I think of this as profound knowledge because it's simplistic, yet you have to hear it at the right time. Like, as you know, you can tell a patient many, many times, but until you link their goals to their emotions, for example, if someone's having a, just a really bad heart, um, have high blood pressure and you say, Hey, how old's your daughter? 
five years old, would you like to see your daughter go down the alleyway to get married? I mean, I think every parent would love to see that opportunity. Mm -hmm. But the likelihood of him being there is not that small unless he changes ways. And the only way to change another person is to subtly express their own emotions to the goal. Yeah, you're absolutely. Spencer, let me ask you this question on top of it. And I know you have Mm -hmm. to go, but like, it sounds like just from the general themes of things, you've implemented support network discipline, and emotional attachment, those top three things. And you've implemented that through how would you express yourself and like how to work on those things. Mm -hmm. Is there ways in which you kind of reach out to the community and try to mentor younger folk in that way? Ashvin, that's actually Dr. Jeremy has been hounding me, not hounding me. He's been doing a great job on being persistent and consistent with me. Because when I look at social media, I'm usually like the opposite. I like to be quiet. I don't really... When I see TikTok, I see people doing dances and whatnot. I'm like, that's oh, not really me. Yeah. And I think yeah. deep down, I think what it really is, is I think I'm afraid of saying what I want to say uh-huh. and then getting judged for it. So sure, I finally made a TikTok account. But even though I say a lot of cool things, I think as long as, long as you can meet 50% of those things, I'm trying to just be take massive action right away. Because sometimes I overthink everything, like sure. a lot of people. Sure. And then you kind of get learned helplessness a little bit where you're like, making this problem way too big. So um, that's that's one of my goals is actually to kind of create uh, an intriguing TikTok just to be a normal dude, but like, hey man, this is, this is me. So one of my oh. things is I have nationals coming up um, May 18th where I get to fight, anyone can go, but um, you get to fight everyone across the United States where <laughs> if you win first to third, you get points, and if you get enough points, you get to fight international competition. So, and when you say yeah. fight, what what type of fight are we talking? Um, about? judo. So it's like judo. A, it's a okay, so this was a sport oh, that, yes, that, 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 that I did not know that. Yeah. I was like, fight. What do you mean, fight? Right, okay, like, <laughs> okay, judo. How very yeah. cool. Okay. Yes. So I think for me, that's like one of the things is, I like anybody. Um, I say a lot of cool stuff, but I think as long as we can just take massive action on our thoughts right away, I think that's one thing that I really need to work on, but, um, I appreciate all the positive things done, Ashvin. This is amazing. This is a great community you surround yourself with. Yeah, really wonderful. It's awesome. You know, I was kind of my background is on private. I was private practice. You know, I was kind of siloed off in the world of psychiatry. And the Fond du Lac community has welcomed me so kindly. And even though I'm in Richmond, Virginia, I meet with the team every single day. I make my way up to Wisconsin now at least four times a year. And it's just just incredible people here. And so I'm just very honored to be welcomed and and I'm honored for you know to help out in any which way and to learn because right like I'm learning so much from you and I've had a little experience working with autism and, and working in in kind of I've worked in patient-centered care but I'm learning so much so it's just it's a cool opportunity just a really cool opportunity absolutely and just to give one take talk about massive action I want to give one thing to the audience if- yeah if they're willing to go, uh, they, if they're willing to get create those standards that they want, and I know a lot of people maybe where their blueprint is right now, it's kind of creating stress because they want to be f- further along than they think they should be. I think a great book to take massive action or just a one random act of kindness is to open the door for somebody, but read Dale Carnegie, How to Influence Friends and People. It's a great read. It talks about the principles that we all go through in daily life, and it's just, it's a great you for it, but thing that I would give to somebody that is ready and willing to step up to the ball play that's maybe going to bring a little discomfort and maybe a little little pain but when you look back at it you'll never forget it perfect and, and what's the name of the title again uh Dale Carnegie um Dale Carnegie how to, yep how to sorry that was the author um how to win friends and influence people oh I love it okay we'll definitely so, check it out Spencer very absolutely. cool absolutely but Ashvin, thank you yes. so much for your time, Dr. Ashvin. Hey, thank you for joining us. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to learn more about you. I'm excited to collaborate with you in the future. Absolutely. It's going to be awesome. I'm it's jealous that, that Jeremy gets to meet you in person a couple of times <laughs> here and there. So I'm going to have to increase my frequency of coming up to Fond du Lac. 
Absolutely. Come on down to the Trefford Studios anytime you want, brother. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. All right. I will I will signal us out then. Um, guys, if you're just joining us now, my name is Dr. Ashwin Sood. I'm part of the SSM Health Trefford Studios. I'm sitting here with Spencer DePease. Am I saying that right? Uh, yeah, very close Depis, but Depis, Depis. Perfect. <laughs> Spencer Depis, who um, is one of our uh, collaborators at the SM Health uh, Trevor Studios, judo extraordinaire, autistic individual who has done such significant work on himself as well as strength based work as too. And it's just an inspiration to talk with that I've learned so much from. Uh, I want everyone in the audience to know that we are. Uh, running this. This is our first Facebook Live from the SSM Health Trafford Studios. We're going to continue to do this on a weekly basis. We're trying to figure out the timing and schedule, but just join our socials, follow us at TreffordStudios.com. You know, we're so pumped, so excited to continue doing this. Dr. Chapman, who's our medical director, invites you guys to check out uh, SSM Health Trafford Studios. And uh, we'd like to bring you just more education about psychiatry, mental health, and all fun things. Okay? All right. Well, it was such a pleasure, Spencer, and we will see you guys at a later date.